let's begin and continue this discussion of Kant's groundwork with the concept of a morally good will. What then is a morally good will? Kant characterizes the morally good will as unqualifiedly good and as the only thing that is good in itself without qualification. All other goods Kant maintains are goods in some other way as a means to an end or are otherwise blended with other empirical or prudential con conditions or whose goodness is subject to compromise by wrongful abuse. He explains this point in this quotation which is now colored blue in front of you. It is impossible to think of anything at all in the world or indeed even beyond it that could be considered good without limitation except a good will, understanding, wit, judgment, and the like, whatever such talents of mind may be called or courage, resolution, and perseverance in one's plans as qualities of temperament are undoubtedly good and desirable for many purposes, but they can only be extremely evil, but they can also be extremely evil or harmful if the will which is to make use of these gifts of nature and whose distinctive constitution is therefore called character is not good. It is the same with gifts of fortune, power, riches, honor, even health, and that complete well-being and satisfaction with one's condition called happiness produce boldness and thereby often arrogance as well unless a good will is present which corrects the influence of these on the mind and in so doing also corrects the whole principle of action and brings it into conformity with universal ends. Moral virtues such as courage, justice, and the like are not, as Kant would say, good without limitation or unqualifiedly good because they can be wrongfully practiced by a morally corrupt will. Thus, a good will is the key to moral goodness. If a morally good will is at work, it can turn virtues and other kinds of assets, commonly called goods, to good intent. Whereas a will that is not morally good cannot make anything, even the best of so-called goods, unqualifiedly good. All of these qualified goods or goods with limitations are affected by the less than absolutely purely good will by which they are used in trying to achieve a certain end. Kant's point is well taken. If we think about the ways in which various things are described as morally good or bad, it appears that anything other than a good will is good or bad depending on whether or not it is made to serve the ends of a morally good will. There is nothing, Kant declares, other than a good will itself that cannot be diverted to evil purposes by an evil will. Whatever we think of as good, or a good, therefore, other than a pure morally good will, is good only to the extent that it is properly used by a pure morally good will, and as a result, is only qualifiedly good, or a good with limitation. Another reason for regarding a morally good will as unqualifiedly good 
is that a pure morally good will is independent of all empirical psychological factors of inclination. This, we have already seen, Kant regards as an impurity in the source of moral good and theoretically in moral philosophy and as something to be excluded from the metaphysics of morals. Kant takes the next step in identifying the proper subject matter for an exposition of the grounding of the metaphysics of morals by recognizing the pure morally goodwill as the only thing that can be seen as unqualifiedly morally good or morally good in and of itself. Kant explains the distinct role of a pure morally good will and inclination that might be in accord or in conformity with moral good and moral law in this way. He says, and it's now in blue font again, a good will is not good because of what it affects or accomplishes because of its fitness to attain some proposed end, but only because of its volition. That is, it is good in itself and regarded for itself is to be valued incomparably higher than all that could merely be brought about by it in favor of some inclination and indeed, if you will, of the sum of all inclinations. If only a morally good will is unqualifiedly good and hence independent of such psychological factors that are otherwise thought to be vital to moral decision-making and ethical conduct, then a morally good will can only be understood in relation to moral duty. Kant's concept of the moral duty of a morally good will as the only good without limitation is explained in this way. I think it's in pink, yes. Let's read this. We have then to explicate the concept of a will that is to be esteemed in itself and that is good apart from any further purpose as it already dwells in natural sound understanding and needs not so much to be taught as only to be clarified. This concept that always takes first place in estimating the total worth of our actions and constitutes the condition of all the rest, in order to do so, we shall set before ourselves the concept of duty, which contains that of a goodwill though under certain subjective limitations and hindrances, which, however, far from concealing it and making it unrecognizable, rather bring it out by contrast and make it shine forth all the more brightly. Duty or obligation, what is required of a morally good will, stands in opposition to inclination. The contrast is between what we are morally required to do and what we may for one reason or another want or desire or be psychologically inclined to do. The first charity donor in our example acts from the moral law, which is to say from a sense of duty, whereas the second and third charity donors are motivated by inclination of one sort or another. The second donor feels sorry for the suffering and is inclined to relieve their pain if she can, at least in a small way by donating extra packet change to a good cause. The third donor is also inclined to act in a way that is in accord with the proposed moral law, although for a different and arguably less noble reason, in order to appear to others to be charitable and for the sake of feeling good about herself in maintaining a charitable self-image. An average person, as a mixture of these and other motives and inclinations, 
presents even more difficulties in discerning the underlying motives that issue in moral or even immoral action. The idea in Kant's theory is that moral duty is something the agent knows must be done even when it conflicts with inclination. I do not want to pay my taxes. I am on the contrary strongly inclined not to pay them because I would prefer other things being equal to preserve as much of my earnings as possible for my personal use. If I regard it as a moral duty as well as a legal obligation to pay my taxes and I pay them for that reason rather than for prudential considerations because I want to avoid legal penalties by complying with the law, then I am acting from a sense of moral duty in a situation where it is relatively clear that my motivations are unclouded by considerations of inclination or desire precisely because by hypothesis I am acting contrary to my inclinations. Kant offers a scenario similar to the three charity donors case that we have now looked at, at from several standpoints. And let us read this one in a bit. It's now in the blue font. For example, it certainly conforms with duty that a shopkeeper not overcharge an inexperienced customer. And where there is a good deal of trade, a prudent merchant does not overcharge but keeps a fixed general price for everyone so that a child can buy from him as well as anyone else. People are thus served honestly. But this is not enough for us to believe that the merchant acted in this way from duty and basic principles of honesty. His advantage required it. It cannot be assumed here that he had, besides an immediate inclination towards his customers, so as from love, as it were, to give no one preference over another in the matter of price. Thus, the action was done neither from duty nor from immediate inclination, but merely for purposes of self-interest. We imagine a child, an inexperienced purchaser, entering a market to buy something. The shopkeeper could easily cheat the child, say, by overcharging or shortchanging or by selling inferior goods. If the shopkeeper does not do this, it might be for at least two reasons Kant considers. The shopkeeper might have acted from a sense of moral duty embodied in the principles of honesty, or the shopkeeper might refrain from cheating the child because of a sense of his own advantage. There are several ways in which the advantage of the shopkeeper might be required by cheating any customer, even if he can get away with it in his transactions with an inexperienced buyer. The shopkeeper's prosperity depends on maintaining good relations with all customers, preserving a reputation for honesty that encourages business in healthy competition with other merchants who will similarly see it in their best interest to maintain everyone's confidence. The small gain to be had by cheating a single customer is therefore outweighed by the risk of damaging good business relations in the community. The shopkeeper knows this and accordingly resolves not to cheat anyone. But not to follow the principle that honesty is the best policy, not a as a moral principle motivated by considerations of duty, but rather as a prudential measure to help assure making more money honestly in the long run. The essential contrast between moral duty and psychological inclination in Kant's account is an interesting expression of the distinction between reason and emotion or feeling and between rational and empirical elements of moral decision-making. The case of the second imagined charity donor in the examples that we've already started with is a noteworthy is noteworthy also noteworthy in this regard a person in this category motivated by compassion and a desire to help others because of a deeply felt sense of their suffering might regard herself as doing her duty rather than following an inclination Indeed, the donor might find herself psychologically conflicted if he, she is not wealthy and if even the spare change she considers contributing to charity represents a hardship for her 
to contribute to others in need. She might find her inclination at odds with her decision to follow the requirements of duty to help those whom she finds herself compassionately moved to help. Her situation is not like that of the hypothetical third donor who just wants to feel good about herself and maintain a reputation of being a good person. Rather, the second donor is not just inclined to turn over her spare change but believes it is her duty to act when and as moved by compassionate feeling. What would Kant say to the second charity donor? Kant does not explicitly consider the possibility that in certain circumstances, it might be a moral duty to follow one's inclinations, particularly if the inclinations at issue are moved by the emotion of compassion for the suffering of others. Undoubtedly, Kant would want to focus attention on the exact relation between the emotion of compassion and the inclination the donor experiences as a result in order to judge whether the donor is acting from the moral law as a matter of moral duty rather than from inclination and merely in accord with moral law. It might be said that a very strong inclination connected with a powerful emotion such as compassion is likely to be confused with an expressed with and expressed as a sense of moral duty. If that were true, then the motive of action would actually be inclination rather than moral duty. There's no problem for Kant. For Kant's distinction in that case or at most only a superficial problem that is quickly dissolved when the donor's reasons for acting are clarified. If there is duty to follow inclination, on the one hand, then Kant has not at least as yet prescribed any specific limited content for moral duty. The donor is acting from a sense of duty and from rather than merely in conformity with the moral law. If you like this type of content, please click, share, and like in your social media pages. This is Samut Sari sa Simula. Maraming salamat po.